I thought we would uh, start with a uh, a poll. Um, so the very first thing, I think uh, we will have a, a question for you. Uh, so which of the following countries does not have an element named after it? There was indeed an element named after Japan in 2016, one of the recent ones. Uh, of course, there are only a couple of atoms ever made, uh, but that is not the right answer. Russia has an element named after it, uh, and the answer actually is India. But there are a number of elements with uh, countries, uh, elements with um, name, that are named after countries. So ruthenium is the element that's named after Russia. It's the Latin form for it. Uh, we have germanium, polonium, francium, americium. Nihonium is the element that is named after Japan. Um, but the spin that I wanted to take on this particular talk was, well, why is there no Englandium? I mean, after all, many elements were discovered in the UK and perhaps uh, in, in you know, just as many uh, were discovered here as there were in any other country, especially if you're talking about non-radioactive elements. Um, well, we almost ended up with an element uh, named after England, and, and that's where we're going to go to. And we're going to start actually with a, uh, a Cambridge scientist, perhaps, our most fam famous uh, Cambridge scientist, and this is uh, Isaac Newton. In fact, we'll also end with Isaac Newton as well. And around 1665, Newton, of course, performed his famous experiment, which you see illustrated here, passing his beam of sunlight through the little hole in the shutter in, in, the, in the room there, through the prism, splitting up the colours. And as I say, I think it's always rather interesting that uh, I think he, he wanted there to be seven colours, which is why we say the rainbow is divided into seven colours now, uh, with red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and violet, although there's uh, not an awful lot of distinction perhaps between some of those uh, bluey colours there. Um, but this was refined a little bit later on. Instead of passing the light through a hole, which actually gave a rather sort of blurry spectrum, uh, when it was passed through a very thin slit, a slightly different result was obtained. And this was first done by William Hyde Wollaston, another Cambridge scientist and a student and fellow of Gonville and Keyes College. And he passed the light through a very thin slit. And what he saw here was, well, instead of the continuous spectrum, of colors, he noticed that there were some dark lines and he thought these were actually divisions between the different colored parts of the spectrum. We now know this is slightly different. And this was refined shortly afterwards. So this first observation of the dark lines was made in 1802 by Wollaston, but then Fraunhofer uh, really uh, brought this uh, to perfection in a sense. He was using this, he was an instrument maker and he used to make uh, spectroscopes uh, sort of essentially telescopes with, with, with prisms here. And he uh, split up the, the spectrum and uh, saw these many, many black lines, as we see here, against the colored spectrum. And uh, we can see this uh, perhaps uh, uh, on, a, on this rather nice colorful first day cover. We know he must be important because he features on a stamp here. Um, and one of the things that I'd like to just bring to your attention now is his rather arbitrary divisions of these, these dark lines. There were many visible here, but the really strong ones he labeled simply with letters of the alphabet. So we have A, B, C, and so on, and D. Uh, and in particular, the D line is the one, the black line in the sort of yellowy region there that you can just make out um, on, the, uh, on the first day cover here. Um, but the true nature of these dark lines wasn't really understood until 1859, and that was with the invention of the proper spectroscope uh, as used in chemistry. And this is what we see here in the, in the very first illustration of this, the announcement of the, of the paper here, uh, by Bunsen and Kirchhoff in 1859. So the sum um, of uh, a, a substance was uh, to be investigated, was introduced onto a little platinum wire, uh, and this was held in the flame of the Bunsen burner, the hot flame of the, blunt, the blue flame of the Bunsen burner there. Uh, and this is, of course, you know, familiar to us all from our sort of earliest days in chemistry with the flame tests, when, for instance, you know, uh, sodium gives a beautiful yellow color and uh, strontium a beautiful red color. And in fact, uh, Bunsen and Kirchhoff begin their papers, and it is well known that certain substances possess the property of imparting definite colors to the flames in which they are heated. Um, but they uh, notice then that if you pass this light through the prism and, and observe this, you see a, a series of colored bands. So this is the, uh, the spectrum. 
and this is what they published again in this very first paper here. So we have the uh, the uh, Fraunhofer uh, dark lines right at the top, the solar spectrum there, and the letters that you see are those divisions that Fraunhof gave, just simply dividing this up. So around the, the red part of the spectrum, we have A uh, going to yellow D and so on. Um, but beneath this, we see these emission spectra. So these are what we get when we heat up the substance in the flame and split up the light. So for instance, you will see for sodium, the third one down, uh, this really bright line in the yellow region. And this is uh, coincident with the uh, D lines of uh, Fraunhofer's uh, spectrum there as well. Now, they notice then that this actually is incredibly sensitive, this technique, and this actually was a whole new um, analytical technique, far more sensitive than any that was available at the time, any chemical test for identification. And they, they um, uh, noticed this, for instance, that, uh, that they tried to um, quantify how sensitive this was. And they noted that if in the far corner of the room with a capacity of about 60 cubic meters, they say that they burnt a mixture of three milligrams of chlorate of sodium with milk sugar, whilst the non-luminous colorless flame of the lamp was observed through the lens of the telescope. And within a few minutes, the flame, which gradually became pale yellow, gave a distinct sodium line, which after lasting for 10 minutes, entirely disappeared. So this was just burning in a tiny sample of something that contained sodium in the far corner of the room. The smoke that was given out was enough to color the blue flame of the, uh, of the Bunsen burner. They worked out then that this was uh, able to detect uh, with ease, quantities of sodium salt less than one three millionth of a milligram in weight. And this was the real power of the spectroscope, that it was able to, to detect such minute quantities. And as I say, this was really opened up a whole new field uh, in uh, analysis. And uh, they also mentioned actually that uh, it would, could also easily detect if you were observing the, the blue flame of the Bunsen burner, if you just knocked a dusty book uh, a few feet from the flame, even that, the dust that was there had enough sodium compounds in it to cause the, the flame to, to color and see this, the bright yellow line. So incredibly sensitive technique. So perhaps, not surprisingly then, they, they realized that you could use this to possibly detect new elements that were difficult to find before because they were at such low concentrations. In fact, they started analyzing all sorts of things, minerals, uh, cigar ashes, uh, but it was their work on mineral waters that was to be most rewarding. In fact, they state that we have the opportunity of satisfying ourselves that in reality such unknown elements exist. We believe that uh, relying upon unmistakable results of the spectrum analysis, we are already justified in positively stating that besides potassium, sodium and lithium, the group of the alkaline metals contains a fourth member. Well, um, in fact, in a fuller report from the following year, uh, they stated that they actually found two new alkaline metals, and we can see their spectrum here. So the top one is, uh, well, the, the top one is the solar spectrum, the one beneath that is potassium, and then there are their two new elements that they found, rubidium and cesium. And they, uh, they, they state that uh, they needed to analyze 44 tons of mineral water from Durkheim uh, to be able to, to, to find this new compound. So say this was the real advantage that it was able to detect these such tiny quantities uh, to show that there was something worth investigating in this mineral water. Okay, so they named, of course, the two new elements um, from the appearance of the spectrum itself. So for cesium, the spectroscope revealed two splendid blue lines situated close together. And they say that as no known element body due to blue lines in this portion of the spectrum, we may consider the existence of this hitherto unknown alkaline element as thus placed beyond a doubt. And they add the facility with which a few thousand of a milligram of this body may be recognized by the bright blue line of its incandescent vapor, even when mixed with a large quantity of the more common alkalis, has induced us to propose for it the name cesium and the chemical symbol CS, derived from the Latin cesius, used to designate the blue of the clear sky. Similarly, rubidium, this was named um, after they treated a mineral, lipidolite, and they observed in the spectrum of this after treatment, 
uh, two, two lines that were especially remarkable as lying beyond Fraunhofer's line A, that's the red lines there, and the potassium line uh, K alpha, this is coincident with it, the red lines that they're talking about here, and they uh, said therefore situated in the outermost portion of the red solar rays, hence we propose for this new metal the name rubidium and the symbol RB from the Latin rubidus, which was used to express the darkest red color. So you can see these two lines clearly in the, in the third uh, spectrum here, the two lines that gave rise to the color that, for this element, rubidium. Well, immediately after this was announced, the discovery of this wonderful new technique, chemists were applying this to all sorts of things. And a British scientist, Crookes, uh, was one of the first to, uh, he had already been using uh, a different form of spectroscope to observe the sun, the solar spectroscope that uh, Fraunhofer was talking about here. But with the modified version of Bunsen and Kirchhoff, he was investigating different minerals. And he started looking at residues of a mineral of selenium. And he noticed that after introducing the sample into the gas flame, he writes, suddenly a bright green line flashed into view and quickly disappeared. An isolated green line in this portion of the spectrum was new to me. He was very familiar with the solar spectrum and familiar with all sorts of different uh, uh, lines from different compounds, but this was a brand new uh, green line here. And it was this line, again, that gave rise to the name that he chose. So Crookes later uh, proposes for it the provisional name of thallium from the Greek thallos, or Latin thallus, a budding twig. He said a word which is frequently employed to express the beautiful green tint of young vegetation and which I have chosen as the green line which it communicates to the spectrum recalls with particular vividness the fresh color of vegetation at the present time. So this was discovered in the spring, this new line, and he named it after the, the, the green shoot of the, uh, the appearance here, which I think is rather romantic. Perhaps less romantic was the next element to be discovered using this technique. And this is in 1863. Um, this is uh, by Ferdinand Reich, a professor of physics at the School of Mines in Freiburg. Well, he began to search for thallium in some local zinc ores and discovered what he believed was a new element. However, because he was actually colorblind, uh, he entrusted the analysis, the spectroscopic analysis to his assistant. This is Hieronymus Theodor Richter, um, apparently a decision which he was later said to regret when the latter tried to claim the uh, discovery as his own. But on placing the uh, residue into the Bunsen flame, he observed a brilliant indigo line, which did not coincide with either the blue lines of uh, cesium. And he named the new element uh, indium after the characteristic spectral line. So it, the, the element indium then is not named after the country directly, I suppose. There's, of course, a link between the color and the pigment, but it was actually named after the appearance of the spectrum, the new lines that appeared here. And we can see these uh, clearly in the spectrum uh, shown on here. And so we have our potassium there, rubidium, cesium, thallium, indium, all named after uh, these new lines. So they're all actually uh, just from the appearance of the lines that appear in the spectrum. So here we have the cesium, the blue lines, rubidium, the red lines there, the thallium green shoot and the uh, indium lines. Well, I, I assume it's those bluey lines. Uh, there are, of course, the sort of pinky lines uh, uh, further on the, on the right of the screen there, but uh, uh, I, I'm not entirely sure which were the ones that they, they, they named it from. So just within the space of a few years, then we had four new elements. But actually, before the decade was out, uh, we could say that another element was discovered. And this was in 1868. But we're going to have to come back to this one. So this one's a little bit more complicated, and we will need to come back to this. Um, so before then, we're go going to jump to this chap. Uh, so of course, uh, those of you that were at the talk last year would recognize the, uh, him. This is Mendeleev, of course. And in 1869, as we celebrated a couple of years ago, he published his first formulation of the periodic table. Um, so this is what we see here, or as he called it, his periodic law. And actually in this, uh, of course, he famously predicted uh, that there would be new elements being discovered, and that he actually said that they would be discovered using spectroscopy, which is perhaps not surprising, 
because it was such a sensitive technique. And if the elements were uh, that easy to discover up to this point, they would have been found. And so it was going to be elements that were so dispersed in nature that you would need this new sensitive technique to, to find them. But anyway, so he published his periodic table here, we see in 1869. And this was the announcement, of course, uh, in uh, the English journals. And it's completely underwhelming. Um, and we just say this paper contains a new plan of grouping the elements according to the numerical value of their atomic weights and lists the first few, so misses the whole point about it, uh, even introduces the error with giving the symbol for iron, Fe, instead of fluorine uh, for uh, element uh, with a mass of 19 there. And I also don't understand uh, what he says. Uh, it says, but there is a considerable hiatus between chlorine 35 and the next silver 108. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure about what this even means uh, in this report here. But the point is, it really, nobody really paid much attention to it. Not until this chap came along. Uh, so this is Paul Emile Lecoq de Boisbaudron, and he discovered one of the elements that, of course, Mendeleev famously predicted that said, he said, would be discovered uh, using the technique, technique of uh, spectroscopy. And this element was also found in an ore of zinc. Now, he needed to use a slightly different technique. Uh, this was using, it needed a much hotter flame in order to be able to see the spectrum. And so rather than using the blue flame of the Bunsen burner, he used an electric arc. And so this was the key, uh, key breakthrough in, in, in this discovery, really. And this is the spectrum that we see here. But now, though, um, Lecoq did not want to uh, name his new element after the appearance of the line. We'd had the previous four elements uh, with their names from the appearance of the spectra there. Instead, well, he said he wanted to name it after the country. Uh, he was a native Frenchman, of course. So he named it after the French uh, well, the, the Latin, Latinized version of uh, France, uh, so he named it Gallium. Or did he? And the, well, the political magazine, uh, La Revue Politique et Littéraire, uh, was rather skeptical of his motives, and it said, uh, it seems to us that patriotism had been foreign to the decision of Monsieur Lecoq de Boisbaudron, who had simply wanted to follow the example of scholars of the 16th century and Latinize his name. The cock in Latin is Gallus, whence gallium to designate the metal discovered by Monsieur Lecoq. Well, apparently his biographers were very keen to uh, point out that uh, he took every opportunity to say that he hadn't named it after himself. Um, but of course, I think uh, it's interesting to note that he could have always chosen to name it Francium instead, and nobody would ever have said that he was then trying to name it after himself. So it was because he went for this Latinized name. I mean, surely he must have seen the, uh, the, the nice connection as well. But uh, let, let's give him the benefit of the doubt and say that it was clearly named after uh, the, the country there. Of course, Francium, the name Francium was used later, would be the choice of Margaret Perry when she discovered this, this highly unstable last member of the alkali metals in 1939. Okay, but what did Mendeleev have to say about this new discovery? After all, this was the first element that had been discovered that he actually predicted, and he pounced on this discovery. Uh, he, so this is the announcement um, in, um, in English, and he says, well, look, you know, I, I've, I've already brought to, to your attention this, uh, my, my periodic law. This is a, a complete system of classification of all of the elements. It corrects some of the masses and it predicts these new elements that have yet to be discovered. And he gave these new elements names. And he says that uh, these elements he've called Ica aluminium. The Ica there means one, this is meant to be one space in his system underneath aluminium. This is where this element should be, and Ica silicium, he says here. And he said, well, gallium meets uh, all the predictions that um, I, I made. So uh, this is the, um, the first, the uh, periodic table here. We see the question marks, for instance, underneath alumin aluminium. In fact, there are two question marks. We see one at, uh, with mass of 44 and one of mass of 68. Now, it's a little bit confusing here. You might think it was the one immediately under aluminium that we're talking about here, but actually that, that wasn't. This is a little bit harder to see in this periodic table here. Um, so Mendeleev actually squeezed two, what we would now say were two different groups into one column. So this third group 
we would now say has the elements from group three in the periodic table, which is, contains the transition metals, and also the elements from group 13. Um, and so he, when he's referring to this new element, uh, we have an element that is underneath boron. So this is the one that I've highlighted here. This is the element that is underneath aluminium. Uh, and this is the element that is underneath silicon. And we can see this more clearly in Mendeleev's original uh, version. Well, this is the one from the volume two of his textbook from 1870, uh, 1871. So here we can see more clearly that uh, we have spaces, these were his predictions. Well, a couple of them are for spaces where he thought maybe yttrium, for instance, should come here, and indeed it should. So these were elements that were already known, yttrium and lanthanum. These were the elements that he was predicting in 1871. So this is the element one space underneath boron. This is the element one space underneath aluminium. And this is the element one space underneath silicon. And so the one that we're talking about is the one shown in red, highlighted in red here. This is his eka aluminium, if you like, one space for no aluminium. This is gallium. And he was very as quick to point out that uh, the properties of this new element gallium matched what he had predicted for this eka aluminium. So this is the first periodic table uh, from Mendeleev to include gallium in it. We can see this uh, here element uh, with mass of 68 um, in its proper space. Now this is the third edition of Mendeleev's textbook. Um, so there we are, there is gallium highlighted. So we now have then these three elements that were predicted by Mendeleev and uh, appeared um, shortly after. So we have our Ica aluminium. Uh, this was named after the, the country in which it was discovered. So this is uh, uh, gallium named after France there, the Latinized version. Uh, we have what Mendeleev called Ica boron, and this was discovered in 1879. Um, well, Latinized version of Sweden, well, Sweden, of course, wasn't a, a defined country in these sort of Roman times. So Scandium was the Latinized version that was taken to, uh, to, to honor this discovery here. And then uh, the element Ica silicium, so one space below uh, silicon, this was uh, what uh, eventually had the name germanium. So all three of these then were named after countries, the Latinized versions of the countries in which they were discovered. Well, I think it's time for another poll just to, to see if you're on, keep you on your toes here. So which of these elements was not named after the country in which it was discovered? So uh, if we can have our uh, poll up now, here it is. Oh, okay. So, okay, things are... It's nice to see things evolving here. And it looks like I, I think we've settled down. And congratulations, I think. Uh, indeed, the correct answer is indeed polonium. Um, so polonium is, of course, named after Poland. But interestingly, uh, Poland didn't actually exist when this, con uh, when this element was named. This was, of course, discovered by Marie Curie. Um, but she discovered it, she was in France at the time, of course, which I'm sure uh, gave the game away. But it was interesting, as I say, that Poland actually didn't even exist at the time. And this was a bit of a political statement on her part to draw attention to the fact that uh, this had been incorporated into the uh, uh, whichever empire it was there, which I, I should have uh, just checked, but I'm sure someone will know that. Uh, so she, as they named this, literally just to draw attention to, to the plight of her country at the time. Okay, so we have our, our three elements predicted by Mendeleev. And Mendeleev actually reported uh, in 1889 how pleased he was that these elements were actually found in his lifetime. And this was in London in an address before the, uh, at the Royal Institution before the Fellows of the Chemical Society. And so he says here, the law of periodicity first enables us to perceive uh, these undiscovered elements at a distance, which formerly was inaccessible to the chemical vision. Uh, and long ere they were discovered, new elements, uh, these appeared before our eyes, possessed of a number of well-defined properties. Um, anyway, so he goes on to describe 
the elements uh, gallium, germanium, and scandium. But he finishes in this, you know, when in 1871, I described to the Russian Chemical Society the properties clearly defined by the periodic law, which such elements ought to possess. I never hoped that I should live to mention their discovery to the Chemical Society of Great Britain as a confirmation of the exactitude and the generality of the periodic law. So this was all really rather nice saying how wonderful everything was. But Mendeleev still dismissed one. And this is the element that we now need to come back to. And we'll see exactly what Mendeleev said about this later. This is this element that I said we had that may have been identified in 1869, uh, 1868 using spectroscopy. So let's just go back to uh, the discovery, Bunsen and Kirchhoff, of the spectroscope. And yes, I mean, they were putting various things into their flame, looking at the brilliant lines that you see. But actually, they also recognized that their te technique might be even more powerful than th first thought. They say that it opens out the investigation of an entirely untrodden field, stretching far beyond the limits of the Earth or even of our solar system. They recognized this technique could actually give some information about what was out there in space. This is absolutely incredible, really. So, of course, by looking at light that comes to us, they could split this up and, and maybe see these spectra. But actually, this wasn't uh, how it was normally used. Instead, we would go back to our solar spectrum. Now, remember the solar spectrum, we have um, basically a continuum of all colors. And this is because in the condensed matter of the sun, all the atoms that are there are jostling. And it means that rather than having these sort of sharp lines, uh, we end up with literally a continuum of uh, different frequencies of light that can be split up, which is wonderful. So this is what we see. And well, but Bunsen and Kirchhoff actually recognized that the black lines that we see in the spectrum did line up with elements that were also known. Um, so, well, it, it appears, for instance, in this, that we see the, the line for A, this red line, it appears exactly coincident with the, um, uh, the uh, Fraunhof, uh, Fraunhofer A line. Well, actually, that isn't quite the case, that it's not um, actually potassium there. Um, but they do correspond to anything that is absorbing the light between the light source itself, which is, of course, the sun, which is given out this continuum, and anything in between the sun and the, the detector or the eye that is uh, recording to the spectrum. So it was eventually worked out what each of these black lines actually correspond to. So the A line turns out to be oxygen in the atmosphere of the Earth. Uh, similarly, the B line there. The, um, the C line is due to atomic hydrogen, and this is in the atmosphere of the sun. This is absorbing the particular frequency that gets hydrogen atoms excited, and this gives rise to the black line there. The D line, this is one that um, Bunsen and Kirchhoff instantly recognized. Well, this was due to sodium. So these would be sodium atoms in the atmosphere around the sun that would be absorbing just the right frequency to give rise to this black line. And so the other lines were all detected, uh, eventually worked out what gave rise to these, these different lines. And most of these were not in the atmosphere of the Earth, like the oxygen molecules, but actually in the atmosphere around the sun. And in the atmosphere around the sun, of course, the extreme conditions there also means that you can get rise to uh, ions as well. And so some of these, for instance, are also due to uh, uh, atoms that have had their electrons stripped off. Now, so we have this, the light that is coming from the sun, but we also have excited atoms in the atmosphere of the sun. And it's actually possible to look at the light that comes from these atoms directly, rather than in the line seen here, which is you know, what we're seeing when we look at the normal solar spectrum, we're seeing all of the light from the sun and the atmosphere is absorbing this. We can actually see that the light that these atoms in the atmosphere emit if we wait for a uh, solar eclipse. And this was what was carried out in 1868. So um, a, a scientist, a Frenchman, um, Jules Janssen went to India to observe the eclipse that was known to be going to be taking place. And he was looking at the light uh, from the solar atmosphere, these prominences um, or, uh, that we can see in this. 
and uh, he was actually awarded a medal for detecting, well, something very exciting in this and being able to uh, observe exactly what uh, light is being emitted from this, this solar atmosphere. In fact, this medal here commemorates, uh, it was a joint discovery by the Frenchman Jules Janssen and an Englishman, Norman Lockyer, who coincidentally also founded the journal Nature. So this is what the medal um, um, celebrates. And we can see the spectrum here. We see the normal solar spectrum is the lower one with the dark lines, the Fraunhofer lines. And so that's what you would normally see if you just split up the light from the, the, from the sun. But above that, this is the light that you'll see from the, the atmosphere around the sun. So here we see the emission lines, these the, the bright lines that are given out. Well, I've been a little bit misleading so far because actually, uh, whilst we have uh, Janssen there in, in India observing the solar eclipse, this medal actually was for a, a, an amazing technique that they both independently invented, discovered uh, at the same time. And this was a method that you could actually observe the, the light that is given out by these excited atoms in the atmosphere around the sun without the inconvenience of waiting for a solar eclipse. And this was the, the crucial discovery. So actually Lockyer made his observation of the light from the atmosphere around the sun um, from London without uh, uh, the solar eclipse. And this is the instrument that he used. Uh, this is in the Science Museum in London. And the crucial thing here is the arrangement of all of these prisms. And this is because what they both realized that when you send your light, a beam of light through a prism, of course, it, it spreads it out. But if you keep spreading out this through multiple prisms, the general light from the sun itself just gets dimmer and dimmer. The more it's dispersed, it's becoming, uh, uh, becomes uh, faded out. Whereas if you have the sharp line of the atoms in the atmosphere, which are just emitting one frequency of light, well, this is just bent round. And so this actually um, survives through all these dis different prisms here. So this was a really wonderful invention of using the multiple prisms. So you could take all of the light from the sun and actually what you end up with is just the light from the, that it is emitted in the atmosphere where you get these individual atoms giving out very sharp frequencies of light. So that is actually the discovery that we see here. And this is why actually in this uh, in the spectrum the lower the, the spectrum at the bottom of the screen here, you can see the two spectra simultaneously looking at the light from the solar atmosphere. Those are the white lines above. Uh, uh, and some of these are coincident with the dark lines underneath, but you'll notice that there's a little question mark near sodium. So the black lines, these D lines, as Fraunhofer called them, uh, they actually line up very nicely. When you look to see uh, with, with greater detail, we see that there are two lines there. These are the sodium D lines. But what was observed in 1868 was this other line, and you can see this in the, in the, uh, in the picture above, this taller line that didn't seem to have a black line corresponding to it. So that you needed this technique, but there was this line here and it didn't correspond to any other known element. So they could work out what all of these other black lines are from, uh, but not this one here. And Lockyer went so far as to suggest that maybe this is a new undiscovered element. And he called this element helium. Now the first announcement of this was in nature, not surprisingly, but it was in a report uh, from the, um, uh, from the uh, British Association for the Advancement of Science. And it was just in a footnote this name appears. So in the report um, by the president of the society, he says, Franklin and Lockyer find the yellow prominences to give a very decided bright line, not far from the D line that we've talked about before, but hitherto not identified with any terrestrial flame. It seems to indicate a new substance which they propose to call helium. This is the first time this appears in print. In fact, the name helium doesn't really seem to appear in print anywhere. Uh, Lockyer doesn't actually seem to mention this. We see the report from the following year, it seems a little bit more skeptical. It's saying, um, so this is from uh, 1872. Mr. Lockyer speaks co as confidently of the sun's chromosphere of incandescent hydrogen of the local outbursts which cause it to send forth projections tens of thousands of miles high, as if he had been able to capture a flask of this gas and had generated water by causing it to unite with oxygen. 
And he goes on to say that, uh, you know, before we really can confidently say that there's a new element, we need to try and isolate this new element here on Earth, just in the same way that thallium had been isolated. So this is what Mendeleev is speaking about. So in this report that where he was saying how wonderful it was that he lived to see the discovery of these new elements, he says, but from all sides, uh, we see attempts to constitute the imaginary substance helium, the so much longed for primary matter. So he didn't believe this thing at all. And he thought basically it would be some modified uh, spectrum of some atom under such extreme conditions of the sun that we, we can't easily replicate this. So he certainly didn't think it was a new element. So, and it proved to be some time, it took about 30 years before this element was actually discovered on earth. And before, you know, to, to see how this was discovered, well, we need to come back and look at the atmosphere of the, uh, around the earth, the gases that are there. The story here begins with work carried out by Lord Rayleigh. Uh, he was investigating to see whether the masses of um, uh, nitrogen atoms or oxygen atoms were multiples, were integer multiples of the uh, mass of an atom of hydrogen. So he needed to really very accurately measure the, the density of these gases, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. Hydrogen was a doddle. Well, when I, when I say a doddle, I mean, it was incredibly difficult to do this and quite remarkable. I mean, he had to have a, 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 a balance room built into the basement of his, his castle, essentially. Uh, and he had to leave this overnight, the balance to equilibrate. And then he had to observe through a window uh, the, the reading on the balance uh, to actually you know, make these accurate readings that were necessary. Uh, what I think is particularly remarkable, so I mean, the way he did this, he, he took a glass flask and he evacuated this and essentially measured the mass of this and then filled it with the gas and measured it again. But I mean, what I find particularly remarkable is that when the glass flask was evacuated, of course, the atmospheric pressure pushes down on this. And so it's ever so slightly smaller. And he actually had to take into account the different buoyancy, which just depends on the volume of air that it displaces. And even this made a difference. So this was incredibly precise work that he was carrying out here. But he measured hydrogen, no problem. He measured the density of oxygen with no problem. But with nitrogen, he did have a problem. And this is because he was being too thorough, really. And this is because he, he, he thought he better check and he checked by preparing his nitrogen in two different ways. In one way, he took it from the air by removing the other gases, removing the oxygen, removing the carbon dioxide and water vapor and so on. Uh, the other way was by chemically preparing this. And he found that the two densities were not quite the same. And so he, he published his, his finding in Nature with a question here saying, you know, do any of the readers, can they suggest what this discrepancy is due to? And he says that this, is, this error is a tiny error, one part in a thousand, but because he'd done this so precisely, he felt quite confident to say that there really is a difference. And the problem was taken up by Ramsey, William Ramsey in London. And uh, he suggested, well, we can remove uh, everything else very easily, all of the gases completely, uh, by uh, uh, easily removing the oxygen, of course, by combining it with uh, copper, for instance, uh, and we can remove the nitrogen by combining it with uh, magnesium. And so this is uh, a letter from 1894 uh, that uh, Rayleigh, uh, uh, sorry, to, to Rayleigh from Ramsey here. Um, so they'd been working on this uh, for some time, and now they'd, uh, he'd finally managed to isolate some of this gas. And, and notice here, he says its density is 19.075. So this is the, the preliminary density he's got. Uh, this would be essentially uh, a half of its, um, its uh, atomic mass, as we shall see later. But um, this, this poses a few problems at this point. They were beginning to, to find that there must be this impurity that's in the, in the atmosphere that uh, can only be detected when you remove all the nitrogen. This is about 1% of the atmosphere, of course. Uh, initially, they refer to this gas, Ramsey refers to this as X, and a few days later, he said, well, it's called it Q or quid Latin for what? Uh, and Rayleigh reported that uh, he'd also been thinking about uh, you know, what would this uh, what name, and he tried out various names, and he suggested the name Aeron uh, from the Greek for air. Uh, but he said uh, that uh, when I've tried this, the effect uh, privately is usually uh, has been when might we expect Moses? So this this hadn't uh, proved to be a very uh, very popular name. And in fact, his wife Rayleigh's wife 
uh, reported that uh, she had heard that um, the gas was also known as Mrs. Harris. And this was a reference to an imaginary friend of Mrs. Gamp, one of the characters from Charles Dickens' novel, Martin Chuzzlewit. Um, curiously, uh, only recently, um, it had been discovered that um, Ramsey also um, uh, deposited a paquet scale with the French Academy of Sciences. This was a sealed envelope. Um, and he's sort of claiming, well, uh, uh, his, his work on this new gas. Um, and this was only opened in 2004, this, this sealed envelope. And in this, he, he says that he was, of course, dis, uh, guided by the experiments of Lord Rayleigh and that he reduced 20 litres of nitrogen down to 200 millilitres. This is about the 1% of this new gas. And in this, he says he, he thinks that it's probably going to be a modification of nitrogen, perhaps N3. Ozone had been relatively recently discovered uh, with three atoms of oxygen. He thought maybe this would be something similar. So he proposes a name of this uh, of um, uh, Ica or Ica Azote. Maybe this is a similar sort of name uh, to Mendeleev's uh, names that he had for his new elements. He recognized, of course, the work of, of Rayleigh. He wasn't trying to, to claim this, but he was just trying to lay claim of his, uh, his isolation of this. Well, the first announcement really of this amazing discovery was in the Times newspaper of all things. Uh, they were reporting on uh, the, uh, 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 a meeting of the um, chemical society here. Uh, and uh, they say that this was you know, huge interest in this when uh, they were making a joint announcement. The reason that this was made uh, with no official uh, announcement of this discovery was because Ramsey and Rayleigh wanted to enter this discovery for a prize uh, at the Smithsonian, uh, which was uh, dealt with new discoveries in air, of course. I mean, this was you know, obviously, it, it, it won, this is an amazing discovery. So this is why they couldn't actually publish until they had actually uh, entered this competition. But apparently the newspaper report didn't count and that was okay. Um, so this was picked up uh, in different countries and there's a wonderful uh, report here um, from a French paper. It says, a professor at Oxford University has discovered a new gas of the air. Until now, we were content with just oxygen and azote. This is nitrogen in the air. The Oxford chemist invents a third and there is great excitement in all laboratories of the five continents. The name of the new gas is not yet designated, but we think that by baptizing it Oxfordgen, we will have helped find a solution that is needed. There is an ox in our proposition, and moreover, a delicate reminder of the city now glorious, which gasifies us. And then they add, when we think that humanity could live for thousands of years without knowing that the air contained different gases, uh, we are really astounded. For a hundred years, thank God, we could learn that it contained two gases. And here, five years before the coming of the century, we have discovered a third, but they say, don't think that we will stop in such a good way. Chemistry never stops. In 1950, a fourth gas of the air will be discovered. And in 1990, it will be the turn of a fifth. And so on at the rate of two gases per century and uh, at um, uh, least until the end of the world. So of course, I mean, this is all just a bit of fun, but it's uh, <laughs> rather nice. The gas was named, it was named uh, uh, again in, in an announcement uh, that it was going to be called Argon uh, from the fact that it didn't seem to unite to anything. But how does this relate to our element from 1868, this, this helium? Well, Ramsey was the first to finally solve this riddle. Uh, riddle. Uh, and this was um, following up on a hint from the assistant of the keeper of the mineral department of the British Museum. So after this first announcement of this new gas, argon, um, it was suggested that, um, well, it had been noted that when you heat certain minerals, apparently nitrogen gas is given out. And uh, he said, well, maybe this isn't nitrogen, maybe it could be argon. So Ramsey immediately bought up all of the mineral that, uh, that, that showed this property that gives out the gases when you heat it and he bought up all the cleavite he could find in London and heated it up, obtained this new element 
And initially he called this Krypton, and he soon found out that it, it didn't show the same spectrum, uh, as certainly not nitrogen and not argon. And eventually it was worked out that this was actually helium. And this was absolutely remarkable. Uh, so uh, of course, you know, soon after this, he discovered the whole series of elements from the gases in the atmosphere by uh, looking at the fractional distillation of liquid air. So argon was the first one to be discovered, which is pointing to here. Helium at the top of the group, uh, from the mineral, though, this is this long lost mineral, and then he found the other elements uh, as traces in the atmosphere. But as soon as it was discovered, he thought, well, there's uh, uh, um, where should they go in the periodic table? So this is when he first discovered was uh, looking at argon itself. And he actually thought that argon might be a, a mixture of different gases, of, of three gases with similar masses. And he thought that these could go after fluorine. Remember that density. He said, you know, he was thinking that the, the mass of this might end up being around 20. Um, and uh, he thought that this would naturally come. So this is uh, a periodic table uh, from his textbook from 1891. He thought that this uh, new gas, the argon, might actually be a mixture of three elements that would come in uh, Mendeleev's group eight above iron, cobalt, and nickel. Um, and he actually suggested that uh, these could be named after the Latinized names for England, Scotland, and Ireland. So Anglium, Hibernium, and Scotium. So we nearly ended up with our Anglium, uh, but of course it was turned out to be just a single gas, just argon. And uh, in fact, of course, Mendeleev had to find a place for all of these elements in the periodic table. And this he did. He actually went slightly wrong here. He put uh, helium in the same, well, we would now say in the same period uh, before lithium, instead of in the same period as hydrogen after hydrogen. But this meant that Mendeleev actually thought there might be uh, two elements lighter that ought to go above helium, two elements lighter than hydrogen. One of these he thought had also been detected in the sun and he called this coronium. It turned out to be a highly ionized atom of iron instead. Uh, but the other element uh, that he thought was going to be the lightest of all, he proposed to name after Isaac Newton and call it Newtonium. And that's where I must finish. Thank you very much.